folks, Nick Culbertson here, and welcome to another edition of Making an Insane Rhythm Game. Last time we finished up our prototype, and today we are starting and finishing the gameplay programming. Things are about to get real serious. Dead serious. In our project today, we will be cleaning up some of the work we did last time, and we will be expanding on it, building out a full level. Today our game will go from a mess of spaghetti code into becoming a real game. Today, I'm drinking some black tea. It's good black tea. I like black tea. I have green tea every morning, black tea at 10 o'clock, oolong tea in the afternoon. Every day. Also every day, I have cottage cheese for lunch. It's delicious. You know what else is delicious? Programming. So let's get started. <laughs> So now we're back in Unity working in super fast mega turbo speed. We are picking up from where we left off the prototype and now we are building it from a hot mess into a hot dog. Once again, I'll put up titles during this time lapse so you know what's happening on the screen while we talk about anything but game development. And today we'll see this project take on a whole new light. At the end of this video, we will show off the progress that we've made. Then all we'll need is the art and music. Let's get started again. I'd like to let you in on a little secret. And actually it's not a secret because I think I mentioned it before. But I mentioned a lot of things. Blast Beats started out as a prototype that was another game. Back in 2016, my wife and I had our first and only child. And not a metaphorical child, a real actual child. Flesh and bones and poop. I'm contractually obligated to say poop at least once in every video. After my daughter was born, I took a lot of time off of work. I took all the time off of work. Until finally, I started coming back in my office and working just one hour a day. And the project I was working on for one hour a day was Blast Beats. It's amazing when you set your mind to it how much you can get done in just that one hour. Especially because you have the rest of the day to be thinking about what it is you're gonna do during that short time frame. And I was able to get a pretty solid prototype off the ground. I wanted it to be a rhythm game like our Blast Beats, but I wanted the music to be procedurally generated so you never knew what level you would be playing. The problem with that was generating real-time audio using sound samples was generating too much lag so it was difficult to have a good play experience on lower end devices. Honestly, I didn't remember getting this far along on the project, but I do have fond memories of playing it now because it reminds me of that time of whenever we had just a little wee one. So for the first time ever, I present to you the blast beats that never was. I don't remember dropping the project or why I did, but ultimately between the time of when I was working on that prototype and now I've released two other games. So I think Blast Beats was just lost somewhere in the mix whenever I started doing Synthwave Escape and Bumpin' Dungeon. Please enjoy, keep your hands and arms inside the cabin, and that's it. Here we are, still changing these guitar strings. There's a debate that goes on amongst artists. Is it better to be a generalist or a specialist? Well, I'm in the camp of it's better to be a generalist. As a independent game developer or a musician, you have to wear a lot of hats. If you're making a video game, you're gonna be a designer. You're gonna be a tester. You'll be a programmer. You'll be an artist. You'll be a marketer. You'll be a film editor. If you're a musician, you're gonna be a songwriter. You're gonna be an instrumentalist. You might be a singer. You're gonna be a live performer. You'll be a marketer. You will become a networking super giant. But one myth about a generalist is that because you're doing a lot of things, you don't do them as well than you would as being a specialist. I think this discounts a creative generalist's ability to take their experience from other fields and apply it to something to help accelerate their learning. For example, playing music and programming and art are all somehow connected, but I can't really put my finger on what it is. I think as you go down the rabbit hole of working on your craft, you find a creative identity, and then you already have an idea whenever you're working on a new skill, how that will tie in to your existing body of work. Plus you're better adept at learning things and failing and growing, but the point is rather moot if what your goal is, is to get a job. If you wanna get a job, especially in the game industry, be good at one thing. They're probably not looking for a game designer pixel artist who's a musician, but they might be looking for someone who just does 3D models or shaders. But if you're gonna be your own boss, then I say go for being a generalist. It might also help you find the thing that you wanna later specialize in. But if you wanna roll in a company, and it can be a creative company, it might be better to double down just on one skill and mark out your niche as being the best shader artist, the best programmer, or the best QA tester around. Oh, that's a bug. Hey, I found another bug, guys. Todd McFarlane, the artist who created Spawn, but also had one of the best runs on Spider-Man and Incredible Hulk. I did some videos on that. Check them out on the channel. You know, I meant to mention him whenever I was talking about generalists, too, because he is someone who 
was an expert artist at comics, then proved to be an expert businessman by going and starting Image Comics, and he created his own line of toys that revolutionized the toy industry. He likes to say that he's a jack-of-all-trade master of none, but I would think of him as a jack-of-all-trades master of many. Another term for these people could be polymath, but that sounds a little pretentious, or renaissance man, but that sounds very gendered. So instead, I've landed on the term creative generalist. Be a creative generalist. Okay, circling back, he is a rock star. While to the majority of people, he's probably known for his artwork, he speaks at all kinds of comic conventions and you can find his videos all over YouTube. And he's like a fearless bad but It might help that he has like a baseball background. So he's very competitive in everything. If you think art isn't a competition, go talk to Todd McFarlane about that. I'm getting there, I'm getting there. Ah. Oh. Next, I'd like to talk about one tactic to help keep these projects tiny, and they are creative constraints. Creative constraints are the boundaries you set for your projects, things that you can and cannot do. An example of some that I've been using for this project is one, the artwork for the sprites are being done using the Pico 8 palette. Pico 8 is called a fantasy console. It's a little piece of software where you can develop tiny games in it, and it is full of constraints. You can only use a certain number of characters in your code. There is a music editor within the application where you create your music for your game. There's a very tiny resolution and also a limited amount of space you can do for your sprite sheet and a limited color palette. Now you would think with these creative constraints that the finished product might somehow be uh, underwhelming. But in fact, the opposite is true. We are blown away whenever we see people create something in Pico 8 that goes beyond our expectations of what's even possible in this tiny program. So one of the value propositions to a creative constraint is you are setting up an expectation for your player or listener, whichever kind of art you're doing. An example of a creative constraint for music might be you decide that all the music you're gonna have in your song is going to be recorded live with no overdubs. This is both going to eliminate the amount of time that you have to work on it and to keep on adding things, but it's also gonna have you stretch that creative muscle to see what all can I actually pull off live? Now, jumping back over to games, another example of a creative constraint is to take an idea of a game and remove everything except for maybe what the core fun mechanic is. So making a platformer like Super Mario Brothers on a mobile phone might be difficult, but what if you took out the left and right movement and instead you could only control the player's jumping? and the platforms are moving under them. Well, that set of constraints created its own genre of games on mobile, the runner game. Other constraints we might have seen recently in games are, I'm gonna make a game where the colors are only black and white, or make a game where you can only play by swiping the screen, making a game that only has text, making a painting only using your elbow. For Blast Beats, we start out with the idea, I'm creating a game. Then we remove a large portion of the pie by saying, it's going to be a rhythm game. It's gonna use the Pico 8 palette. It's gonna have a pixel art aesthetic. It's gonna have crazy visuals and be very easy to play. We're not gonna spend too much time on it and we're gonna make all the music ourselves. So then you see that our giant pie of a game became a very tiny slice by the end. This is how you can take even your most big grandiose idea and make it something that you are able to create in a shorter amount of time. These creative constraints will not only make your project smaller, but they will work to your advantage. And your players or listeners will appreciate that you have pushed the boundaries of what is possible in such a tiny box. Since we're removing some of the fluff and filler with creative constraints, we're now gonna make sure that the things that are left in your game have the maximum impact. And we'll go into that a little bit more later on in the series. Here's where we got today. Now you can see our game actually looks like a game. We can navigate through screens, we can play levels. Some of the menu art has been gussied up and we have the background looking how we want. Next time we'll be adding in more of our sprite art, but so far, this could pass as an actual video game. Dance time!
Thanks so much for watching the video. I hope you're liking the series so far. Come hang out with me in the comments. Like and subscribe. You know all the stuff. I say it every freaking time. Today things are looking pretty good. I'm feeling pretty good about our progress and it's going to be smooth sailing from here on out. Next time we're going to be working on the art for our project and I won't make any promises, but I do promise it'll be amazing. It's going to be the best video you've ever seen. <laughs> I'll see you rock and rollers next time. Boom! Boom! Next time. Best day is art day. Putting on these guitar strings. <laughs>